Sunday nights we're studying the book of Revelation and we're studying it from the viewpoint of the number seven because Revelation has probably got more sevens in it than any book in the Bible other than, of course, the law. But in the New Testament, seven is the number of completion and divine refinement. And we're talking about Israel in this book. And Israel began, uh, Israel began in Genesis. Actually, uh, the ancestor of Israel was Adam, uh, the ancestor of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. In the lineage of Adam, first of all, came, uh, we see in the lineage of Adam, we see Seth, who begins that lineage. And, of course, Seth means substitute is what it means, substitute. And Seth, according to the Jewish custom, you find this in the 22nd chapter of Matthew where the Sadducees who did not believe in a physical resurrection came to Jesus and they said, if a man is married to a woman and he die, and then his brother marry his 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 brother marry his brother's wife up to seven brothers in the resurrection whose wife shall she be well of course jesus said you do err not knowing the scriptures for in the resurrection we will be as the angels which neither marry nor are given in marriage but when they when the sadducees asked this question it was a legitimate question because the jews had a custom and it started with seth that if a man died that his brother would take up his seed and any seed that he had or any children that he had would be of the lineage of that brother who died. We see the same thing happening when Judah, uh, Judah's son Onan refuses to plant his seed in the woman in the, seed, in the uh, belly of Tamar. He did not want uh, this to be his brother's seed, heir, to raise up uh, seed to him because heir had died. Well, Seth means substitute. He's the substitute for Abel. That fifth chapter of Genesis, Genesis 5, is the lineage of Israel. It's the ancestry. It starts with Adam, and Adam has a son, Seth, who is the substitute for Abel. This is the way this goes. Abel, a uh, Cain was the firstborn, was the firstborn. And Cain slew Abel, the secondborn, secondborn. And we know that, that uh, Esau was wrestling with Jacob in the womb, and that it was Jacob, the secondborn, that was best, blessed. And the scripture says that Israel, Israel is the firstborn of God there in Genesis, the third chapter. The Lord said, uh, Moses, you go to Pharaoh. You tell him, let my son go, for Israel is my son even my firstborn, and we know that Peter stood in Acts 3, and he told Israel, he said, you kill the prince of life, and Jesus was the secondborn in the flesh, secondborn Jesus, and of course, Israel slew Jesus, and God had another seed in the place of Jesus whom Israel slew, and that was the church. We took the place of Christ. That's what that's what Seth is a picture of, is a picture, it's a substitute for Abel, who was the second born, and we're the substitute for Christ, who was the second born in the flesh. He was the only begotten of God because Israel was God's firstborn in the flesh, not to take from the deity of Christ. Before, he, before the beginning was, Jesus was the Word. He was the only one taken out of God himself or the only begotten of God. So Seth is the ancestor of Jacob, and the lineage uh, is, is, begins there in the fifth chapter, and it goes down through his son Enosh, and it goes on down through uh, Mahalaleel and down uh, to uh, the lineage of Jared, the sixth from Adam, and then Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And these are all fathers and sons. Enoch and then Methuselah, and then Lamech, and then Noah, who is the tenth from Adam. And then Noah's son was Shem. He was the second born, just as these were second borns. And Shem received the blessing of God. 
and he's the one that was blessed. The scripture says, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. God blessed Shem, and only one can receive the blessing. And then Shem had a descendant, and all of these, this was one family starting with Adam, and it was the, Israel is the, is the uh, ancestry, the ancestry of Israel goes back to Abel. This is Abel's lineage according to the substitute's uh, son who would marry the surviving wife. And then, of course, Shem had a great, 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 great grandson whose name was Abraham. Then Abraham had a son, Isaac, that, that was passed to, and then Jacob. So Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and he had these 12 sons, goes back to goes back to Genesis, that fifth chapter, and that's the lineage of Seth. In fact, you find Seth being begotten in the fourth chapter, in that 25th verse, I believe it is. And if this is all Israel. Well, this is the lineage that God gave to Israel, and of course, then they became a nation. God gives the land to Abraham, then to Isaac, and then to Jacob there in Genesis 12 and uh, 12 through 17th chapter, and then, and then he gives, he extends that promise to Isaac and then to Jacob, and these were all second borns. This is just a picture of the second birth receives the promise of God. The first birth is rejected. If you'll notice, what kind of an offering was it that Cain brought? He brought the works of his hands, the work of his hands. He brought his good crop. He said, look at there at the crop I planted and I brought this. I'm giving this to you, God. Abel brought, Abel brought a blood sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. Who, ta- who told Abel to do that? That was certainly Adam that come to him and said, Abel, you have to give a blood sacrifice because it was God that offered the first blood sacrifice to cover the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden when he killed an animal to cover their nakedness. They did the same thing that Cain did. They tried to take a fig leaf and cover their nakedness, and God said, that's not enough. You need a blood covering, and that was the first blood baptism was in the third chapter of Genesis. And, and then, of course, uh, uh, all these were second borns, and the second birth received the blessing. The first birth tries to married eternal life by the works of his hands and say, see what I've accomplished? Look at all my awards. Look at all my applause. See my accolades. All the world is recognizing me. That'll get you nothing. Uh, You have to be born again. It's the second birth that gives you eternal life. And then, of course, the church took the place of Jesus and uh, uh, Seth took the place of Abel. This is the lineage of Israel and they became a nation God gives the land to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, changes Jacob's name to Israel in the 32nd chapter uh, of Genesis. And then Israel is, and all of the Bible started with Adam pointing right directly to Jacob and to Israel, the nation, and his 12 sons. And then, of course, Jacob, through his son Joseph, is is put into... uh, I'll get this right in a minute. Joseph is is sold into bondage to an Egyptian caravan. I'm sitting here thinking. Uh, he's sold into into Egypt, and then when he gets older and he goes through this episode with his brethren, they're the ones that sold him. Then they go over into Egypt and they stay there for 400 years, and then they're delivered by Moses, and then they come out of the captivity, they go into uh, the wilderness for 40 years, and they come back uh, to possess the land somewhere around 1400 to 1450 B.C., 1450 B.C. Uh, Abraham was born around 2166 B.C. Some of the writers say that was approximate date. Of course, Isaac has to be born at 2066 B.C., if that's true, because Isaac is born when Abraham is 100 years old. Well, uh, they come out of the, out of the uh, bondage, come back to the land to repossess the land, and for an 800-year period, they're uh, ruled by judges, judges, and kings. For a 500-year, approximately 500 years, they're under the king's 
about 300 years under judges, men like Gideon and Jephthah and Samson and so forth and Deborah, uh, and then for 500 years, and then they're scattered because they go after Baal in the grove, Baal in the grove. And what we did, what we've been doing, we went through the study of the books of the kings, which is just simply all being pointed in that direction from Seth all the way down to Jacob. This is the timeline right here. That's the lineage of the people of God, and it starts with Seth. Israel is actually Abel's bloodline. That's what it is. Seth took his place, and he raised up children to Abel, his brother. That's what he did. So Abel is not dead by any means. This is Abel right here. It is Israel. That's what it is. It's to prevail with God, and Abel certainly prevailed with God. Now, of course, we went into the books of the kings, and we studied these kings, and we've gotten down to Jehoram, where he has a confrontation with Naaman, who is told by Elisha to go dip into the Jordan seven times. And Naaman has leprosy, and the Bible is equating leprosy with a, a seven times washing. That's what it's equating it with. And when you see the word seven, I'm giving this to you every week because this is very important. When you see the number seven, in fact, we'll get into some other numbers. I do a gematria series, and I do some number series. In fact, there's some numbers in the Bible that's just unbelievably interesting and a whole lot more than I've ever discovered. I do a gematria series, and it's just very, very interesting. But when you get into numbers, for instance, when you go back to Seth or you go back to Adam and you go, uh, I give things like this once in a while just to remind you how numbers are significant. Uh, you, you can start with Adam. You can start with Adam and you can count down 11 men, 11 men, uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Go to the 11th from Adam, and the 11th from Adam is Shem. And Shem, the, the word Shem is the Old Testament word name. It means authority, and that's because Shem was God's authority upon the earth. It wasn't Japheth, the eldest, and it wasn't Ham, the youngest. It was Shem. When they said, let us make us a name at Babylon, they said, let us make us a Shem. Well, Shem was God's authority, and he held the office of Melchizedek. I do a Melchizedek series, and I show you that while he was alive, he was holding the office. You cannot offer a sacrifice anywhere in the Bible without being a priest, a priest of God. Well, who was the first priest that offered a sacrifice in the Bible? Who was the first priest? Huh? Gosh, we got a lot of answers. <laughs> Who was the first priest in the Bible that offered a blood sacrifice? Abel. It was God. God covered the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden with the blood of an animal, and I believe it was the blood of a lamb. Wasn't it? That's the first blood baptism in the third chapter of Genesis. Well, he's the one that had Ted to teach his son Abel to offer a blood sacrifice in Melchizedek is without beginning of days or end of life, and it is in order. When the Bible says that Jesus was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, the word order is the word T-A-X-I-S. That's a military term. It means a succession of people. It's just like the high potentate of the temple of this lodge of 1929 and then here you got another picture if you go into the lodge. You got all these pictures hanging on the wall, 1930, 1931, 1932, and they'll go all the way down the line and they'll show all these pictures of the head of this lodge. That's called a taxis or a tact. We got our word tact or tactical. It means an order, a fixed order is what it means. It means an order of people. Well, Jesus being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, 
That's what it's talking about. And you cannot offer a sacrifice anywhere in the Bible unless you are priest. Well, the Aaronic priesthood doesn't come until Jacob's sons, and it certainly doesn't come out of Joseph. It comes out of the Levites. The Levi was the third son, was the third son of Jacob, and out of him comes uh, Aaron later on, and out of Aaron's children, that's the high priests of God, high priests, and you cannot be a priest of God. You can't offer sacrifice. And you've only got two sets of priests mentioned in the Bible. You've got the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood, and you've got the Melchizedek priesthood or the priest of Salem. Jerusalem is the city of Salem or Jerusalem. And I believe that where Abel offered his sacrifice was on the same spot or Zion today, what we would call Zion, where the temple of God sits. So Abel has to be the first in the order when, when man takes up this order of Melchizedek, but Jesus was the one that walked in the garden with Adam. It was Jesus pre-incarnate uh, in the flesh before he came incarnate. It was Jesus, so he's the one that started the priesthood and taught it to Abel. He taught it to Adam and told Adam to tell Abel, and if there's a priesthood here, the only priesthood it could be would be the Melchizedek priesthood, the order of the priesthood. Now, I did a series on this, and I didn't mean to even bring this in tonight, but that's what this is all about. This is about the lineage of Israel, and they become a nation. We've been talking about all of these kings. I just thought I'd kind of pitch that in. Oh, I was going to show you this. If you go to the 11th from Adam, that's Shem, and Shem was the second born of Noah, second born then you start with the next set of secondborns, and you go to Shem's secondborn, or Fax at L-R-P-H-A-X-A-D, and you go to the 11th from Arphaxed, and you get to Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Jacob was secondborn. So, 11 goes to Shem, 11 goes to Jacob, who is their Israel, and these are the blessed of God. And then you go to the third set of 11, you count down 11 from Jacob, and you come down to David. And what's amazing, and I'm just showing you numbers here, the third set of 11 is David, isn't it? That's the third set of 11. You got one set of 11 down to Shem, he was the blessed of God. The third set of 11, down to Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. He was second born. And then the third set of 11 takes you down to David, and he was the second king of Israel. Saul was the first king. And three sets of 11 is what? One, two, three. Three to 11 is 33. David is a type of Christ, and David is the 33rd, and Jesus begins his ministry at at 33 years old, and David reigns for 33 years in Jerusalem. You think all these numbers are kind of accidentally falling together? Numbers have exactness all through the scriptures, and I won't go into a lot of those. I'll come back to the numbers, uh, but I'd like to pitch some of this back to you once in a while to make you think, and if you really start looking, numbers are unbelievable. Actually, you could go back to you can actually go back to Jacob and count to his 11th son, and that was Joseph, and his second born, Ephraim, received the blessing of God to have all of the inheritance of Israel. So 11 and 2 go together. We talked about 7 and 4 going together, but 11 and 2 go together. 11 and 2 go together, and if you pick up this uh, this... Um, let me get it here. This Gray's Anatomy, if you pick up Gray's Anatomy, this will tell you that the 11th cranial nerve goes from the brain to the backbone and it splits in two sections. I mean, it's utterly amazing how numbers add up in Scripture. Well, I just said that just to remind you of some things and to tell you that seven doesn't mean just seven. Seven has the idea of refinement. Here's some words that has the idea. Refinement, 
or baptism or completion. And when we say baptism and grace and truth ministries, we're not talking about water, H2O. That's not what we're, we're talking, we're not talking about that. We're talking about blood baptism. A blood baptism, a blood baptism was a martyrdom or a death. And when I say that, one fellow said, do you mean people you have to actually pay with your life, literally die in order to go to heaven? Well, no, I don't mean literally die. The word death is the word thanos, T-H-A-N-O-S, or a variation of T-H-A-N-A-T-O-S. And most of your scholars, when you go into in-depth study, they'll say that death, death does not merely mean annihilation, it means separation. And you know that makes sense because when we die, we don't cease to exist. Our breath and our consciousness leaves this body and goes to be with the Lord. The Bible says to be absent with the body Something's going to go be present with the Lord. That's our consciousness. So it actually means separation. And when you go through a blood baptism, a blood baptism was a martyrdom in the first century. And when you become martyred, you're blood baptized. And we sing those songs. Uh, Are you washed in the blood? Uh, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sing these songs, and yet we don't even know what they mean. But those writers out of the 1800s knew what they meant. So a blood baptism is a martyrdom or a death. When, and when you start telling truth, you go through a blood baptism and your family separates from you. That's exactly what Jesus said, didn't he? He said, I came to, not to bring peace but a sword. And it will cause a variance. The word variance means a separation there in the 10th chapter of Matthew. There will be a variance between you and your family. That's supposed to be. I know it gets discouraging saying, my family don't believe God, they don't believe the truth. Well, welcome to the world of Christianity. True Christians, Jesus said, are going to be separated from their families, and their people are going to get angry at you. You're going to be falsely accused. You're going to be lied about. I'm lied about constantly. If, If most people in this ministry had to be lied about as much as I'm lied about, it would hurt your feelings so bad you'd go home and you'd cry for six months. Did you know that? Now, I'm not saying that I'm without feelings because I have laid in bed and not slept for a month at a time because somebody's mad at me and I don't have any idea why they're mad at me. But what they're doing is separating from me because they can't handle the truth. That's what it is. And I have learned to say thank you, Lord, and and not even being angry at somebody at the same time knowing that I am appointed there too, there in 1 Thessalonians Three and three. No man should be moved by these afflictions, knowing that you were appointed to this. We were appointed there too. Refinement is a baptism. The Jews, Mr. Isidore Singer says, uh, when you look up baptism in Isidore Singer's Jewish Encyclopedia, he says the Jews said that baptism was a refining fire. Well, that's when we're being completed, and I think of the word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Remember, I've been giving you the word for seven. Uh, there's the word Shabua, S-H-A, S-H-A-B-U-W-A, uh, or S-H, it's also spelled S-H-A-B-U-A-H, and then you have the word S H E B. U-W-A-H. Well, this word Shabua that comes from this first word here, the first word means a week, a week, or sevened. That's the same word that's used in Daniel 9.24 where the scripture says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Well, 70 weeks is talking about this word weeks is actually the word sevens. Seventy sevens, it's this word shabuah. That second word, S-H-E-B-U-W-A-H, that's the common word for oath, and it's a derivative of the word seven. So whenever you're talking about being sevened, you're talking about taking an oath to God. Now, an oath is a promise, And it is a mutual promise. God's got a contract. It's just like 
a, it's just like a real estate contract, but it's a contract of eternal life. He chooses his children. He predestinates them, chooses them, and says, you will sign the contract. How do we sign the contract? By circumcision. And that's when we are sevened, and it takes our entire life to cut off sin in our life. Circumcision is a type of cutting off of sin. So when you're talking about being sevened, I keep saying this every week. It's like it's as though seven was an adjective and that it's not just, uh, well, it is an adjective in some sense, but it's not a noun. Uh, adjectives do, do tell uh, which, what kind of, and how many. Well, as an adjective, it could tell how many, but this tells actually how, how we are sevened, or excuse, that'd be an adverb in that case. But... That's, that tells how we are refined. It could be an adverb. We'd say this is a sevened man, a sevened man. It's a man who's going through, or a sevened Gerald. Gerald going through a refinement. He's going through a blood baptism. And that's the entire program of a man's life. That's why leprosy, which is a type of sin, was equated with the number seven because sin is removed from our life by sevening us. And we found that all through the scriptures that a blood baptism had to do with seven. Remember in, in 2 Peter 1 and 5, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. Well, faith has to have something added to it and what's added is seven different things, and it starts with virtue, it goes through patience, and it goes through temperance and godliness and knowledge, and you end up with brotherly kindness and charity, which is agape. All of these t things take your entire lifetime to be seven. That takes us back to the book of Revelation, and we're talking about all these seven. So when you think of seven, Think of a process in your life that has to do with being refined. It has to do with being blood baptized and, and causing self to die. You don't learn to die all at once. When people say, Jim, what is death to self? It's certainly not something you do one day. I had a guy tell me one time, well, I already died to self 10 years ago. Well, you did. He said, I repented 10 years ago. I don't have to repent anymore. Yes, you do. You have to be turned daily. And, of course, that word seven, meaning completion, always reminds me of the word teleos or teleotes, T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S. When you find the word perfect or perfection in the New Testament, it's usually a derivative of one of these words, which means to be completed. We're being perfected in Christ, and we're being completed through this sevening of a blood baptism, and that's what these sevens are about when you get to the book of Revelation. If God sets up a, a word to mean something, to take an oath, he doesn't change it by the time he gets to the end of the Bible. We're being seven. Let's go back to the first chapter of Revelation. And the reason I believe that men can't see the book of Revelation is they do not understand types and figures. In fact, in the first verse of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, he signified what is going to be happening unto John his servant by an angel. Well, the key word here is signified. The word signify is the word S-E-M-E-I-O-O, -O, and it comes from the word simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. That is the common word. Simeon is the common word in the New Testament for the word sign. When, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, we would seek a sign from you. Well, the Jews got signs in the Old Testament, and John said, God is going to give me a spiritual sign. The only people that get these signs are the believers. They got signs in the Old Testament. They got a fire by day, fire by day, a fire by night. They got a cloud by day, 
to lead them, cloud by day. Their shoes didn't wear out. Shoes or clothes didn't wear out. Wear out. Their, uh, their feet in 120 degrees, sandy, hot Arabian desert did not, did not swell up. Now, it, that's nothing less than a miracle right there. Their feet did not swell in this hot weather. God kept their feet cool. And they got uh, bread or manna in the morning. And the people said, we want meat. We want meat. We want somebody to give us meat. God said, I'll give you meat. It'll come out your nostrils. Well, that was the doves he gave them. He gave them doves till it was just because they were murmuring against God. He gave them doves in the evening. They got water out of a rock. Let me tell you the great miracle. The great miracle, when they came out in the desert, it's estimated that there were anywhere from two and a half to four million people when they left Egypt. Four million people walked out of Egypt, came across the Red Sea, and walked into a desert. How long do you think four million can people can live in a desert if I'm leading them into a desert? Without the Word of God, they're going to start dying like flies. But God's not going to let any of them die. It took the miracle of God for a man to walk into a desert in front of four million people. Well, that was certainly the miracle. They got signs. They got all these signs. If their enemies came up against them, they'd conquer their enemies. And that's why when they got to Kadesh Barnea and they wouldn't go in to conquer the giants, God had given them all these other miracles. Why can't he conquer giants for them? He can. It's just that it's funny how that God can supply your need, kind of like Asa. When Asa had to face a million chariots of the Ethiopians, he had to face a million Ethiopians, and they had 300 chariots of iron with those little scythes on the side of the uh, wheels. And then when he got older, he couldn't go to the same God that he prayed to in the 14th chapter of Second Chronicles when he said, Lord, let not man prevail against thee. Lord, it's nothing with you to help with those that have little or those that have much. Let not man prevail against you. Instead, when he has to go up against Baasha, the king of northern Israel, he comes up and he goes, tries to employ a pagan Syrian king like Ben-Hadad to help him out. Well, God performed all these miracles and much more. That's why the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, if you want to look at it with me, 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, this is why the scripture says this. My old Bible ain't turned too good, y'all. Go. Excuse me here. 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 22. For the Jews require a simeon, a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, the Jews required a sign, and that's why the Pharisees came to Jesus in the 16th chapter of Matthew, said, give us a sign that all these things that you're doing. And Jesus said, from now on, you unbelievers are going to get no sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's resurrection. That's the only sign. But when he comes to John, John is a believer. The miracles were to strengthen the faith of the believers. That's all they were for. This was to strengthen John, and he's saying, John, I'm sending my angel to you, and he says this in this first chapter, and he said, he's going to show you signs. So everything in the book of Revelation is a simeon. It means a flag or a signal. 
It means he's going to point to you what these things mean by certain signals, by certain idioms and metaphors that you already, as a Jew living in a Greek cultured world, you know what these things mean. But you and I don't know what they mean, so we have to go back and understand what a seven is. Well, we've been talking about all these sevens. I won't write them on the board. I've read them on the board every week. I'll just name them off. you got seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven candlesticks or seven lamps, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven last plagues, seven golden vials, seven mountains, and seven kings throughout the book of Revelation. You got these sevens. Do you think they still don't mean a completion? You've got two complete numbers. One is seven. That is a religious perfect number. You have a secular number. All your scholars will agree that ten was a perfect number from a secular viewpoint. They said any multiple of ten was a a form of the original number. If you had seven, if you had seven or seventy or seven hundred or 7,000, all of this was a form of seven. In fact, I, I did a gematria tape. Gematria is where that when the Hebrew language was begun and when the, when the, when the uh, Greek language was begun, they would take each one of these letters and start off assigning these letters a numerical value. They'd actually start with one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, hundred, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, so on. That's the, what they would assign to it. Well, I took all of the Hebrew names from, from in those first 22 sets of people that I showed you a while ago from you have 11 down to Shem, then you have another 11 down to Jacob. In those 22 sets of people, Adam all the way through Jacob, Jacob, that's 22 sets of people. Jacob was the 22nd from Adam. I took all these 22 sets of people, took all the names, and put them on the board and took every numerical original value, and I went from Adam to Israel. I took Jacob's righteous name, Israel, Israel, In the Gematria, I took Abraham's righteous name, not Adam, but Abraham's righteous name, which was Abraham, meaning father of many nations. Abram, which was his name before, meant high father or proud father. That's an evil name. So is the name Jacob. That means deceiver or heel catcher or supplanter, one who trips up another. I took Abraham's righteous name and Israel's righteous name, Jacob's righteous name, and all 22 of those names from Adam to Jacob or to Israel adds up to exactly 7,000. And there are 7,000, the Scripture says, that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So seven has to do with a righteous number of completion. Now, let's go back to Revelation, the first chapter. We see the seven churches, and when I say seven, the word Shabbat, from the word Shabua, we get the word Shabbat, Shabbat comes from the word Shabua. You remember the word S-H-E-B-U-W-A-H, that means an oath, and that comes from the word seven, and Shabbat means to seven oneself, to seven oneself are to be completed or filled to the full. There's a word that means to seven oneself. That comes from the word oath, which comes from the word seven one. So when you're talking about seven oath, both those words come from the word shabbat, meaning to fill to the full or to seven oneself. It means to go through a blood baptism. Now, we see here in We see the seven churches. When we say seven churches, it doesn't actually mean seven churches. There were seven in number numerically, but it means much more than that. It means the seventh church 
or the completed church. There were seven churches in Asia, but there were much more than seven churches in Asia. God uses this number seven to show a completion. Then you see the seven churches named in verse 11. Seven means numerical, but it has a, it has a figure uh, of speech, or it has a simeon. It is a signal to signify something. It has to do with being completed. And you can get that out of Jewish encyclopedias, the Encyclopedia uh, uh, Britannica. You can get it out of the McClinic and Strong. You can get it out of any number of dozens of books in my library. It's not even, a, it's not even up for argument that it means completion. Uh, you'll get that from the liberals and the conservatives alike, that it, it's a number that means to be completed. Well, then you've got the seven candlesticks in verse 12. You've got the seven candlesticks in verse 13. The seven stars in the right hand of Christ. I said this the last couple of weeks. You've got seven stars in the right hand of Jesus. And when you get to the eighth, uh, ninth, and tenth chapter of Revelation, you've got seven angels, and each one of them have seven trumpets, and when they sound the trumpets, a star falls to the earth. It's talking about these stars right here. That's what it's talking about. Well, down here in verse 20, here is part of your definition. You've got to remember the seven stars, the seven spirits, seven churches. But in verse 20, you get the definition. Chapter 1, I keep saying, is a glossary to the book of Revelation comes from the word glossa, meaning a foreign language. A glossary is a section of a book with words that are foreign to the average reader, so you can turn over there. And any time you get in trouble in revelation of understanding, always go back to the first chapter, and it'll tell you what these things mean. Well, let's write this down again. The mystery of the seven stars from verse 16 that's in the right hand of Christ which thou sawest in my right hand. And don't think that right hand is there for no reason. The right hand was always considered the hand of authority. The incoming prince stood at the right hand of the king, the one who's going to be receive the coronation. Well, the scripture says that uh, that the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jesus says that is at the right hand of the Father, but it doesn't mean there's a gray-bearded old man called God up there, and he's got a young son standing on his right hand. That's not what it means. First of all, God is not old. He is forever. And when he speaks of Christ at his right hand, he means the prince that is to be king. That's the place of authority. So when you see the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, that has to do with the authority of Christ is going to be these seven stars. Now, let's look at it. The seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven candlesticks. The seven stars are these seven angels. It doesn't say seven but each one is an angel, and angel is angelos, and it means messenger. The seven stars are the seven angels. Seven stars equals seven angels of, or the seven messengers. And all of the preachers were called angels or messengers. I think that's what they're called today. The seven stars equal the seven messengers of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Seven candlesticks equals seven churches. Now, what this is about, the seven stars are the seven messengers. If a man is a messenger of God, he has to have the Spirit in him, and that's the seven spirits. He's got to have the Spirit of God. So you got seven spirits, or you got the seven spirit, or the Holy Spirit that's been refined in God's church. You won't really start... You know what the refined Holy Spirit is? 
It's when God takes you through so much fire. God took me through a lot of fire in my life. I went out and tried to be a famous young gospel singer and a famous young preacher, and then I went out and tried to be a big famous superstar in the music business and got to travel with all these big stars and do backup vocal and went travel with a bunch of Vegas people, a bunch of stars out of Nashville and a bunch of circuits with various people on these circuits with a letterman and and blood, sweat, and tears, and all these famous guys were. And I was in there sitting on the verge of all this, and God had to seven me. He had to stop all this. He had to make me real sick, and he had to nearly kill me. And he brought me to that place. And he actually, I wasn't willing to talk predestination, even though I understood it when I was 20 years old. I didn't understand it fully, but I believed it. When somebody introduced it to me, I went, I just embraced it. I said, wonderful. And I knew very few people believed it. Well, God had to take me through my 20s and just, I mean, I went through all, I traveled from one end of this nation to the other, went in hundreds of churches. You can't believe the little churches I've been in in New Mexico and Arizona and Seattle, Washington and Moses Lake, Washington, in Montana and, and all over Illinois and all over Nebraska and all over Iowa and all up and down the eastern seaboard. And God had to literally burn all of this out in me I'm trying to tell you how that you become sevened. When the Holy Spirit is refined in you and God calls you to be willing to say the truth, that's when you become sevened. Well, God took me through all of that, and then I got in my 30s, and I got off out into the pop music world and said, I'm going to get rich and famous, and the world's going to see me and know me. And I can't sing worth a flip right now. I don't even like to sing anymore. Used to have this big super tenor voice that could do magnificent things with it. Don't even want to do that anymore. And what God will do, He'll take all the things that you like and the things that you place value upon, and He will take that from you in order to seven you. That's what He did me. He put me on my deathbed where I thought I was dying at 37, got up out of bed got back in the music business, got to managing some acts for a couple of years, and I turned 40 years old, and I went into real estate. And I come out of the chute flying like a wild man. Uh, first year, top salesman out of 30 people in the company I was with, and one of the top salesmen in Sumner County. And just kept on just flying until I ended up back in the hospital at 45 years old. Now, understand, all this time I've understood predestination, but I wouldn't stand in the pulpit about 44 years old, about 20 years ago, and I wouldn't go ahead and say it. I would study it, but I wouldn't use the terminology. And God stuck me in the hospital, drained all my bank accounts, all my IRAs, all my investments, and I laid in the hospital and I blamed all the gospel music promoters. This is how God sevens you and makes you willing this is how he makes you a sevened church. And he made me willing. I laid on a hospital bed up here in Hendersonville Hospital. Mary said she thought I was dying. I thought I was going to die that night. I told this nurse whose name was Barbara. I don't know anything else what her rest of her name was. I remember her name tag. I said, I, I, I may die tonight and go be with the Lord. And she said, you don't mean that. I said, ma'am, you don't know how much I mean it. I was 44 years old, dying. And I laid there, and I quit blaming everybody except myself. God's got to really make you put the blame on yourself. And when I started, I said, Lord, I blamed. And I started naming the gospel music big stars that kept me out of the big concerts. And I started naming the big singers. And it wasn't because we wasn't good, because the group I had was fantastic. It was really, really one of the best singing groups that would ever been in gospel music or in the pop music world. And that's when I had to admit that God was... It quit blaming the evil men. Yes, the evil men were, were beating me, but God was picking them up as a sword. And David said, Lord, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword and thy hand that is sevening me. And he woke me up. And I said, okay, God. At 44, I said, let's do it your way. I've been trying to do it my way for about the last 20 years. Let's try it your way. I said, I'll preach to everybody. I was being sevened like the seven spirits here in the seven candlesticks. I had been sevened and made willing to...
to preach the Holy Spirit that was in me and to continue studying and not hold back anything. When you become seven, you won't hold back. You'll say, here's the truth. Now, I know I'm fixing to make all my family angry. I know I'm fixing to make all my friends angry, and I'm going to have to get me a new set of friends because nobody's going to like me after I say this. I was smart enough to know that, and so are you. When God sevens you, he will make you come to a place and he'll say, that's enough of you. I've had all I want of you. And you'll say to yourself, I've had all of, I want of me too, God. I'm tired of me trying to have my way. That's when you become seven. Can you understand that? I know you may not be exactly at that place, but if God ever really sevens his people, you'll say, I'll say the truth if it runs off everybody in my family, all my friends, if they fire me from my job, and if I end up out here with no food and no way to get around, God, I'll preach for you. But the Bible says if we seek this kingdom of God and his righteousness through our being seven, through a blood baptism, through a martyrdom, he will add food and clothing to us, and we won't have to worry about that. When you become seven, you'll know it. You'll get real bold, you'll get real brazen, and you'll start saying the truth to everybody and calling everybody down. I can't walk by somebody in a mall or anywhere else. If something is in earshot and some guy says some stupid, erroneous thing, I walk up and say, Mr., that's not true. Now, there was a time I wouldn't do that. But if you get sevened, and I pray for more boldness than I've got right now. I pray for that every day. God, give me boldness where men want to kill me. And that I haven't always been that brassy. I'm just really tired of the world, and I'm tired of me, and I'm tired of the flesh. And if you get tired of yourself, you'll say, God, I want to say it for you and live for you, and that's all that matters. And that's all that will matter. This can sound like a boast or whatever you want to sound like. That's not the way I mean it. I'm trying to tell you God has done this to me. He has actually seven me, and he keeps sevening me. He'll bring you to a place where he'll throw the switch in your mind, and you'll say, okay, God, I'm sick of trying to do this my way. Is anybody here trying to do things your way? Are you trying to figure out how to tell your family about Christmas, how to tell them about predestination? Do you know there's no way to tell them except straight on? The only way you can do it is say it. If they're elect, they'll hear. If they're not, they won't. It's that simple. We can't get that out of our minds. And when we run across somebody that don't accept it, we want to stand there and argue with them. Well, why can't you see this? Now, this is the truth. Now, it says here in the Bible, and I, I'll walk away quicker than anybody else here because I know that God has already got it set. They'll either believe or they won't. And I'll stop talking to somebody quicker than anybody. I'll say, it's like that Santa Claus me and Mary rebuked this past week at the Opry Mills Mall. We walked by, and Mary said, he said, Oh, oh, Merry Christmas. She said, we don't celebrate Christmas. It's pagan. He said, I feel sorry for you. I said, listen, mister, Christmas is pagan. I said, are you a Catholic? He said, no, I'm not a Catholic. I said, it's for Catholics. It's the Mass. I walked away from him. Now, you may think, gosh, that's awful blunt, Jim. Do you know why I do that? I don't do it to be a smart aleck. You know why I do it? He might be elect. I, he might be elect. If he's elect, he'll hear that. I'm not trying to figure out who I can get to come to Christ. I'm saying, here's the truth, mister, and walk away. And one of these days when I get to heaven, maybe one of them will walk up to me and say, you said that to me, and, and I get real blunt. The older I get, the more plain speech I use. Not to hurt people, to find out quick, is this man elect? Let's see if you are. Hey, repent. And if you do that to people, you cannot, I keep repeating, you cannot run off the predestinated elect with sheep food. You can't do it. I don't care if you say, eat this food. I keep saying this. I can take Cricket, my dog, and say, you eat this dog food right now. She'll be glad to oblige me. She don't say, well, you can't, you're offering it to me the wrong way. She'll go, ha, 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 ha. I mean, like some pig. You, you can argue with her while she's eating it. She don't care. She's going to eat it anyway. That's the way sheep are. They're going to eat sheep food. The only reason I get right to the point quick is I don't have time to sit around playing with these people. And it doesn't take, you don't take somebody down the Romans road. 
That's not what you do. You get right straight to the point and say, Mr. If you're elect, you'll hear this. You need to repent of your sin. Christmas is paganism. Goodbye. That's all they need to hear. Next time you sing, you say, have you talked, thought about what I told you the other day? It doesn't take any more than that. It takes truth. It's not how much you give somebody. You don't have to give them a train load. Give them some. If they're elected, it'll cut into their heart. It's that simple. We waste too much time trying to convince a bunch of goats to come into the kingdom, don't we? We don't need to do that. So if a man is seven, this is what he's going to go through. Now, I've gone through a bunch of this. First chapter gives you a glossary. Second and third chapter names off these seven churches, which I'll come back to at a later date. The fourth chapter shows you spiritual Israel. It shows you the throne, which is the Ark of the Covenant. It shows you the 24 elders, which are the 24 sons of Ithamar and Eliezer. It shows you the gold crowns that the high priests wore upon their head, which were the gold miters from the 28th chapter of Exodus. It shows you the lamps burning in front of the throne, which is the seven candlesticks in front of the Ark of the Covenant in the outer sanctuary. It shows you the sea of glass like crystal, which was the brazen sea. It's all of this. It's showing you, but now it's all spiritual. And here's the veil. Here's the Ark of the Covenant, seven candlesticks, and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. That's the basic tabernacle right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six items there. That's the tabernacle. And then you see the four beasts. The four beasts had the faces of a, of a lion, an ox, of an eagle, and of a man. Those are the four critters that God formed his covenant with in the ninth chapter of Genesis when Noah came out of the ark with man, with the cattle of the field, with the beast of the field, and with the fowl of the air. The king of the birds is the eagle, the king of the beast is the lion, the king of the ox, the king of the cattle is the ox, and then man. And you see these four beasts, and you have four of them inside the holy of holies, to one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, and two of them uh, emblazoned in the veil. Then we see them throwing their crowns, since they're saying we cannot interpret the book of the new law written on fleshy tables of the heart. That's in the right hand, if you'll notice. There are seven stars in the right hand of Christ, aren't they? Remember? Right hand is the hand of authority. We'll look at verse, verse 1 of chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him, hand of authority, five and one, the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written. There's a book in his right hand. There's seven stars in his right hand. I believe the seven stars is the book because the seven stars is the message, isn't it, that coming from our hearts, out of the bunch of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is... Abstract terminology is what it is. But that's the way they talked. The reason America can't see the truth is they thought figurative and allegories and metaphors, they had abstract terminology, and we don't have much of that in America. And they actually spoke in that abstract language constantly. Well, there's seven stars in the right hand of Christ... And there's a little book in the right hand written within on the back side sealed with seven seals. In the back side of the Ark of the Covenant, there was an opening, and that's where they slipped the tables of stone inside the Ark of the Covenant, in the back side of it. So there, that's... And since this is the fleshy tables of our heart and out of our hearts... Out of our mouths, out of the mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When we speak, that's the refined Holy Spirit in our hearts. So I believe that the little book, in fact, this is the same little book, if you go over here to the, uh, uh, to the 10th chapter, the 10th chapter of Revelation... And we see the seventh angel sounding in verse 7. In verse 7, 
Then you see in verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. Here's the same little book which standeth upon the sin upon the earth. That angel was Christ, and he's the same one. You say, Christ is not an angel. Yes, he's the messenger of God. Now, I'll come back to this at a later date to show you why this is Christ. He's, of course, he's got the rainbow over his head, and that's the bow of God's revenge. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And what is this a picture of? It's a picture of when you first hear the Word of God, it's so sweet. A lot of people say, oh, this is wonderful. I love this truth. I think I'll run back and tell my family. What happens then? It gets bitter in the belly, doesn't it? You start to digest it, and you're going, oh, man. This ain't what I thought it was going to be. I didn't realize my family wasn't going to like this this well. And it's the book that's in the hand of Christ. That's the seven angels or the seven messengers, or it's the seven Holy Spirit of the church. That's the book because it's coming out of our hearts. This is the book that the 24 elders of the sons of Ithamar and Eliezer, the sons of Aaron, cannot interpret. They say, we can interpret that book written on the law, fleshy tables of the heart. We can interpret that book that was kept on tables of stone in the Old Testament, but this book we don't know. Here, Lord, we throw our crowns at your feet. You be the high priest and interpret this book because this is the one that's in his right hand. Are we not God's authority upon the earth? Are we the one executing his law? So his, in his right hand are seven stars. That's the Holy Spirit or the seventh message of God in us. That's what's written in our hearts that comes out of our mouth. And what comes out of our mouth, we're the candlesticks. The Holy Spirit is in us. And inside the seven candlesticks was oil. That's the type of the Holy Spirit. What comes out of our mouth is the type of the flame or the light of the world, isn't it? That's what it's talking about. Now, I got so many things on sevens. I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to jump in here and give you some things on sevens. Of course, when this book is so phenomenal, I'll just go back to chapter 8. Chapter 8. When he had opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Seven angels. What are the seven angels? The seven, it's the seven message or the seven Holy Spirit in us. Remember when you get seven, that's when God deals with you so severely that caused you to give up self. Now, I don't know if he's going to deal with all of you like he's dealt with me. There was a time that I lived and died for my voice. I took all these voice lessons, and I, I thought, man, the guy... And I, I had one voice teacher said, when it sounds good to you, then it's good. He said, don't think. He said, a lot of people think that they're making sounds that other people can hear that they can't hear, and that's not true. <laughs> yeah, if you sound bad to you, you sound bad to everybody else. And when I sang, it sounded real good to me. I said, boy, that sounds good. I like that. God's got to take that from you. Whatever it is that keeps you. Now, the Scripture says that we're to lay aside the sin and the weight that does so easily beset us. Some things in our life are not sin, but they're weights that stop us from serving God. One of the things that stopped me from serving God fully was my vocal ability. If you hear me, heard me sing, most people that hadn't heard me sing wouldn't believe that's me. I've had people say, that's not you. I'd say, yeah, it is. God will stop you with whatever he has to stop you with. 
whatever is the thing you're most proud of in your life is what he will take away from you if it is your health, if it is your looks, if it is your intellect, if it's your talent, whatever it is, if it is your family, if it is your kids, he will stop you and seven you. I have a real fear what God will do to me. Jim, that's a gift that God gave. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's the great gift, though. The great gift, the great gift is when he gives us faith or death to self. Faith is the gift of God. And all of these superficial gifts like the talent we have, getting rid of a talent, that doesn't mean anything. First of all, who needs another singer in the world? I mean, we don't have enough of them, do we? We don't have enough guitar players, do we? Enough drummers, enough piano players. They got 500 million of them. More than there's room for in the world. I can, I can organize them. I can run an ad in the paper say, looking for unbelievable, fantastic musicians. And I go out here and start auditioning. And you can get 100 guitar players that'll just knock your socks off out of Nashville. They're standing behind trees down there and hiding under rocks. It's, it, it's crazy. They're coming from all over the world to get rich. There's probably 200,000 musicians in that town down there. Did you know that? And a lot of them are great. You can get them cheap. And you get them cheap. That's right. You can buy them cheap because they're not anybody. And God's got to... But man is so proud of his ability, God's got to stop you. And that's called being sevened is what it is. Now look back over here at... Here's the seven angels. That is the sevened spirit in us. The sevened church, isn't it? When you... These guys who say there's a pre-trib rapture and it happens here uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the third chapter, you don't find the church. They'll say, after the third chapter of Revelation, you can't find the church in Revelation. Well, the seven candlesticks are the, an- the seven stars of the seven angels. Do you find seven angels after the third chapter of Revelation? And the seven candlesticks is the seven churches, and you can't have the seven churches or the seven church or the refined church without having the refined Holy Spirit. So wherever you find one, you have the other, and you got seven angels, or you got the refined Holy Spirit in God's refined church in the eighth chapter. Don't you? We're going to be here all the way till the end, till the last trump. Besides that, you can't be seven in a pre-trib rapture. No, you can't, can you? Yeah. Yeah. And they say, God won't beat up his wife. When he beats his wife physically, it has nothing to do with beating her up. That's like saying, you won't whip your children. He won't whip his wife. Are you kidding? He'll beat you within an inch of your life, and he'll take everything you've got. If God has to, he will break your neck and make you serve him from a hospital bed as a quadriplegic. That's what he will do. Told a friend, told a friend who's a drummer, never seen a man with hands like that. I mean, he could do it. He could take a, a mathematical number that was divisible by, and take each, each hand, but divisible by a common number, and take each foot and each hand and have four different beats going. And he did, studied drums all over the world, all kinds of beats, the African beats, those beats from Asia, and he was teaching guys that didn't know anything about this. And he lives right around the corner from me. And I said, Kyle, Tell you what God will do. He'll cut your hands off. And say, now, do some paradiddles for me, Kyle. A paradiddle is paradiddle, paradiddle. I said, you can't do any paradiddles without hands. You can't do nothing without hands. And he said, he said, Jim, don't say that to me. He said, that makes me hurt just saying that. Let me tell you, that's exactly what God will do. Whatever the weight is that keeps a man from serving God, he will seven his children. That's scary, isn't it? Huh? You think he won't? He'll destroy your family. If he's after you, he'll get your family. If he's not after your family and they're vessels of wrath and you're a vessel of mercy, he'll destroy them to make you bow to him. That's scary, isn't it? 
It's frightening to fall into the hands of a living God, and that's not talking about lost people in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. It's a fearful thing for believers to fall into the hand of the living God because when he gets through with you, he'll break your heart, break your mind, break you, put you face down, and he will seven you and make you willing to say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do today and every other day. Give me strength. And Lord, I feel miserable while I'm doing it, but I'm going to do it. And regardless how miserable I feel, it's my duty. That's what he does to us. If that don't scare you, I don't know what to tell you. Do y'all realize just the few people we got in here tonight, 20 years is going to bring some very devastating lives to some of the people sitting right here under my voice. Some of you will probably be dead. Some will go through some suffering that you'll think, I can't possibly take this. And God may have you in the process of sevening you. That's what he does. And that's what this is talking about. Look back here in the 8th chapter. You see seven angels, and they sound seven all through here. And this is the refined church preaching is what it is. They've got seven trumpets, but if you remember in the 4th chapter of Revelation, that first verse... And in that first chapter, what's that, verse 12, 11, or verse 10, that there was a great voice as of a trumpet. He equates voices with trumpets is what he equates. Well, if the seven angels is the seven spirits or the refined Holy Spirit that's in us, the candlesticks, and the light from our mouth is a picture of the light that comes from these bowls of the candlesticks, then that's what this is talking about in the 8th chapter. This is talking about the church preaching the judgment of God. I'm not the only one that's going to be bold enough to stand up and say, here's the truth. You have to deal with it. I know that Yancey and Carrie are very bold. I know that. I know Larry is bold. But the older you get and the longer you live, the more you're seven. And the more you get tired of you and the more you get tired of the world, sometimes if I am so fed up on certain days, that's my boldest days. Don't you find that, Yancey? If you're just fed up on certain days, I'm sick of this. I think I'll just preach this guy just for that. <laughs> that's the way you feel, don't you? When you're fed up with the flesh, you say, I'm going to go tell somebody something. Maybe they'll kill me. Hey, mister, you've got to repent. Don't care if you are a Santa Claus. When you're dead. When you're dead, you're through seven, you ain't you? Huh? When you're dead, you're through Yeah, he's through sevening you when you're dead, yeah. <laughs> when you get literally dead, there ain't no more sevening. Yeah, yeah. That's it, Calvin. <laughs> now. The guy in the seven days, uh, I meant the Genesis six to seven days, is that God sevening? Well, that's God sevening the world because he rests the seventh. And he finished his work. His work was complete in seven, wasn't it? And wherever you find the sevens, it's the same thing. That's when Naaman's dipped seven times. Sin is finished in seven. Seven is completion. And the more, we're never going to get rid of all the sin in our life. But the more he sevens you, the more fiery trials he puts you in, the more he makes you prepared to get real blunt and straight with the world and not play around. That's very offensive to a lot of people. I know my words sound real offensive sometimes. I'm not trying to offend sheep. Sheep won't be offended. They may be offended when they're baby sheep, but as they grow up, they'll come around and say, gosh, Jim, I used to be offended that I'm not anymore. I realized what you were doing. I'm trying to get to the point real quick. I'm just tired of playing. I don't have no time to play. People who play games with me, I don't have time to do that. I've got... I keep saying this. People say, you sound like you're being pitiful. I'm not being pitiful. When you're 64, you don't have... 20 years to live. 25? You actually think, think I'm going to be 89? I've had one heart attack and I got asthmatic bronchitis and I get pneumonia at the drop of a hat and I'm going to live to be 89? I don't believe that. Just stretching it 20 years. You know how fast the last 20 years have passed? They have flown. 
the next 20 is going to go faster than that. I don't have any time to play with anybody. I'm going to say the truth as quick as I can, as hard as I can, as straight as I can. It's time to do that for all of us, isn't it? Is it time to quit playing? It is. Gerald, you don't... You actually think Gerald has got 20, 25 years to live and he's got a pacemaker and he's got all kinds of health problems? You think he's going to live that long? No. I hope not, too. I hope we both out of here before long. And I look forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting out of here. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that Ashtaroth that we've got in New York Harbor. Yeah, that Ashtart. Yeah. Now, this is the church preaching is what it is. Seven angels with seven trumpets. And we see the first one sound in verse 7. The second one sounds in verse 8. In verse 10, and I keep repeating this, the third angel sounded. Now, what are these seven angels? I'm going to keep asking you the question. They're the seven stars, aren't they? Go back to... Go back to I'm going to hold my place there on verse 10 of chapter 8. Let's go back to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1, verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And down in verse 20, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. So seven, the seven angels or the seven message of God is the seven stars. The seventh message of God is the stars of heaven falling to earth, isn't it? When we preach the truth, this is the judgment of God falling to earth. In verse 10, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. Evidently, they knew what stars meant. When you go back to the sixth chapter of Revelation, back to the sixth chapter of Revelation, verse 13 and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. This is not talking about meteorites, asteroids. This is talking about the judgment of God falling from the mouth of the seven spirit within the seven church. Without understanding this kind of terminology, and I, you know what? You know how many people I've heard preach this in my life? No one. No one. Well, you go down here to the fourth angel sounds in verse 12. Then the fifth angel sounds in verse 9. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. These are the seven stars falling, aren't they? Are the seven message of God in our mouths falling to the earth, preaching to the world. That's what it is. And then, of course, you go on. And you've got the seven, you've got uh, the sixth angel sounding in verse 13. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet sounding the sixth time, loose the four angels which are bound in the river Euphrates. Always go back, take your trumpets and I'm going to go through this, but I'm not going to go through it tonight. But take your trumpets and compare your trumpets. You've got seven angels sound with seven trumpets. Seven angels, which is the refined church. Seven angels sounding with, what if I said a sevened voice? And that's the Holy Spirit refined in us. Refined. Refined. And then you've got seven vials. They're going to be poured out. The first seven angels, you've got seven angels with seven vials. It's the same seven angels. And if you'll notice, the seven angels are the refined church that preaches. It preaches a more of a subdued message the first seven trumpets that sound, then the seven vials. With the seven angels that sound the trumpets, if you'll notice down here, 
uh, in chapter 8, uh, in verse, for instance, verse 7, the first angel sounded and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. But not all, when you get down to verse 8, the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire. We said that's Babylon, was going to be a burnt mountain. She was called a proud mountain. And God said she was a destroying mountain. I'll make her a burnt mountain. You see her burning in the 18th chapter. Was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures were in the sea that had life. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Just a third part is showing that this isn't the complete judgment of God. When you get to the bowels, all of the things in the sea die. This is like a pre-warning when the angel sounds. It's like I'm preaching right now. Judgment's coming, and God destroys partially. And when he gets to the vials, this is the final judgment of God when the wrath of God falls upon the earth. When you get to the seven vials, everything is devastated. Now, I'll get into the vials as we go. You got seven all through here. You got the seventh angel sounding, and that's the completion of the church. In fact, go back and look at that. Go back and look at that. In, I'm taking my time going through this, but go back to chapter 10. Go back to chapter 10. You had the sixth angel sounding over in verse 13. Remember, this is figurative language. You've got to remember that. And then, in verse 7, of course we know this is Christ, the angel, that he's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow upon his head in verse 1. His face is as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had his in hand, in his hand, a little book open. This is the book that the, it's the seven stars in his right hand, it's the little book in his hand, in, later on in this chapter that they eat, and it's sweet in their mouth, it's bitter in the belly. When you first begin to taste of the Word of God, it's sweet. But when you get out here and you try to tell the world the truth and you think you're going to go home and tell people about predestination and Christmas and they're going to like this, they're going to love it, and you find out that they hate it, it becomes bitter in your belly and you say, I can't hardly stand this. And sometimes you even get sick at your stomach because your family can't handle it. And your belly can't handle it. It's too hard to digest, isn't it? We can't digest this Word of God. It's too hard. How much time do I have, guys? 13 minutes. All right. Has a little book, and he's got one foot on the sea and the other foot on the earth. I said last week, you got the end of time. Revelation 6, Revelation 10, or Revelation 8, when the Babylon is cast into the sea. Revelation 10, Revelation 11, Revelation 14, Revelation 16, Revelation 18, Revelation 19. You've got the end of time in all of these chapters, and here is the end of time right here. Christ puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he hath cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders, seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write... And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things with the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And what did the seven thunders utter? I don't know. Okay, how's that for an answer? And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. It sounds like the end of time to me, doesn't it? You? Yeah. So where does that thousand years after that if there's time? <laughs> if time is no longer, yes, yeah, what I'd like to know. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to that in this Revelation series and go back and cover that. I'm not by any means finished with Revelation. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, this is the last trump of a seven series. That You have seven trumpets in a series here at the end of time. In, in Matthew 24, verse 29, after the tribulation of those days, that's the time factor. In verse 31 of chapter 24, the Lord shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. What are his angels? His messengers. What's that? Us. We're refined. We're sevened. It's not like these guys were talking about different things. In fact, there in that same section, there in verse 30 of the 24th chapter of Matthew, the stars of heaven fall to earth. What's that? The seven stars in the right hand of Christ. And you had seven stars in the Old Testament. That was the Pleiades, and the Jews said that brought the sap up in the vine. They called that the morning star, and they said that kept them from having famine, and famine is the first judgment of God. And Christ is called the morning star. He's the spiritual Pleiades, and he's the one that brings the fruit out in the vine, and the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit, and he's the vine. We're in the seventh millennium. Yeah, sure are. We're right at the end of all things is where we are. I believe we're close to the sounding of the trumpets. I don't know exactly what this is talking about. It is talking about the judgments of God, and you're going to see equated as we go back through these trumpets and go through these vials, you're going to see the judgments, uh, the ten judgments that God brought upon Egypt. You're going to see the equation of the judgments of the seven, and ten is also a secular perfect number. So you're going to see the judgments that God brought upon Egypt, and I'll I'll be going into those as we study this thing in Revelation. So, during the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. There's the fully sevened, because the word finished is the word T-E-L-E-I-O-S, teleos, comes from teleates, meaning perfected or completed, that has the same meaning as Shabbat being sevened or to fill to the full or complete. The church is complete. It has been fully sevened. The last person has come in. It's time for Christ to come back at the signing of the seventh trumpet. That's the last in a series. You got three sets of seven trumpets. You got seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And in Joshua, the sixth chapter, you've got seven priests on the seventh day as they walk seven times around the city with seven trumpets, sounding seven trumpets, and the judgment of God comes, and the walls of Jericho fall. That's at the sounding of the last trumpet. Last is always equated with seven because seven is the number of divine completion. And then you've got the ecclesiastical, that's two sets of seven trumpets, Joshua 6, Revelation the 8th, 9th, and 10th chapter, and then in the Jewish law, you had their ecclesiastical year starting in the month of March, April, and at the first of every month for seven straight months from the time that the harvest began in March, April, in March where they started harvesting the barley harvest all the way until October when the last of the crops came in, they had a seven-month period there. And at the beginning of every month, they had a new moon, and they had a festival to the new moon. When the Bible says, don't let anybody judge us according to the new moons, it's talking about the literal new moons of the Jews. But they had seven trumpets that sounded each month, At the first of the month, they had a trumpet sounded, and the seventh would sound at the end gathering of the last harvest, and that's a picture of us being gathered in and the wheat being gathered in with the tares and God separating the wheat from the tares at the seventh trumpet. And that's when we're going to be changed back to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at that. Here it is right here. 1 Corinthians 15, I never did really finish this, 51, 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trump. At the last trump is the time factor. When the seventh trumpet sounds in Revelation 10 and 7 and Revelation 11 and 15, the seventh trumpet will sound and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ and He reigns forever and ever. We're going to be changed at the last trump. God's not going to take us out of here and uh, deprive any of us of our being sevened. He's not going to deprive us of our martyrdom. That would be a deprivation. God would not be gracious to us if he allowed us to be pulled out of here and not martyred for his sake. And he, some, of, some of the people that's remaining here, we were to alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Look at that First Thessalonians. Let me just give you these one more time. I don't have much time. First Thessalonians 4, 4. In verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We're not to have excessive sorrowing in our life. When you get to mourning too much in life over any given thing, you're not to have that in your life. Not as a believer, not like the people in the world who are vessels of wrath who have no hope. That's right. Let's get away from it. Let's get on with life. I go through some sad times, but I know if I'll just get up the next morning and do that for two or three mornings, this feeling will go away. And I know I'll get it again a couple of three weeks later. And if I just keep going, it goes away. Nothing comes to stay. Everything comes to pass. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those who sleep in Jesus is a term for those who have died in Christ and they've gone to be with the Lord. Their bodies are sleeping, their spirits are with the Lord. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. For this we say unto you that by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain. Now the word remain doesn't mean we're walking around in this world. Here I am remaining, I'm working my job remaining. That's not what the word means. The word is the word perilipa, P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O. It means to survive some great onslaught or some great holocaust. We which are alive and survivors of the tribulation. Unto the coming of the Lord, to the physical arrival, the word coming is parousia, physical arrival, shall not go before, the word prevent means to go before those which are asleep in the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now the word shout, I've said it before, but let me say it again. That word, that's the same shout that Joshua and the seven priests of Israel were marching around Jericho and they shouted and the seventh time around they shouted and they sounded the trumpet seven times and at the seventh time they shouted and the walls fell down. That shout was a war cry for, Je for Joshua and his troops to attack Jericho. Well, this word shout here is the word kaluo. K-E-L-L-E-U-O. Kaluo. That word kaluo means a war cry. This, if God's giving a war cry, this is not a secret coming that only the saints will hear. It's not a secret coming at the beginning of a tribulation. This is the last trump. We were to alive and survive the great onslaught. We're going to be caught up together with the dead in Christ who have died for their testimony. So when you define the word remain and the word shout, the very essence of the word shout being a war cry, a commander giving his troops a, an attack a, a command to attack. This is not a secret coming at the beginning of the tribulation. There is no pre-trib rapture. That's the stupidest doctrine I ever heard in my life. And I heard my father and 50 preachers preach it by the time I was 15 years old. And they'd preach pre-trib rapture. And I used to think as a kid, this don't hold any water. Where are they getting this? And it doesn't because... He's going to descend in heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together 
with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be, ever be with the Lord. This is at the last trump because we're going to be changed at the last trump. That's when we're going to be changed. Well, they're making God a liar. Huh? If there is one, they're making God a liar. Well, yeah, how can there be one when God says we're going to be changed at the last trump? Let me show you something. I'm out of time, but go over here to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. We see Christ coming. In verse 11, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. And we see that he's got a vesture dipped in blood. His eyes are as a flame of fire in verse 12. And, and his name is called the Word of God. And he's got a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. He's going to tread the winepress. Right before this, if you'll notice back here in verse 7, Right before Christ comes back, he's coming back for his wife. She has to make herself ready. Verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. It hasn't happened yet, has it? No. And his wife hath made herself ready. When the virgin wife made herself ready, she had to be dressed in white when she was taken out. Remember the, the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins? And the five wise virgins, they were clothed in white and they had oil in their lamps. This is a picture of the refined church. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. What is this wife? This is the church, isn't it, making herself ready. How is her robes made white? By a blood baptism, by being seven, that she has been completed. When you go back to the seventh chapter of Revelation, you see all those gathered around the throne of God, and their robes are made white in the blood of Christ. They have been sevened. I'm out of time, ain't I? I'm a long way out of time. I'm going to come back and finish. I'm, I need to come back and go through the 20th chapter, really finish up this rapture thing because I haven't said everything about it, and I need to come back to the seven vials in verse 5, chapters 15 and 16, and i got to take you back to the seventh chapter to show you the uh, the... 12,000 out of each tribe and how that they're sealed. And then I've got to take you to the 14th chapter about the 144,000, which is a figurative picture of the complete church. And then I've got to take you back to the 9th chapter and finish the scorpions because I haven't finished that yet. I, unless y'all already understand it. Y'all already got it down. I, I really want to, and I don't, I, I don't see how you can teach Revelation without talking about it for about six, seven years, about seven years. 144,000 is a figure of what? That's for the complete church. Seven is the number of the refined church. 144,000 is 12 times 12. Twelve tribes, 12 apostles, 12 baskets full of bread so that none would be lost. That's the total church. The com they, they ain't talking about it. No, no, that's not right at all. That has nothing to do with that. The people say there's 144,000 preachers of the gospel. It's stupid. It's dumb. It's not what he's talking about. Let's, we'll come back to that next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for an understanding of this book because, Lord, if we hadn't spent a lot of years looking at the figures and looking at the simeon, the the signs, the signifying. If we don't study what these things mean, and Lord, if we don't know what seven means, we can forget this book. What a God you are to give us such a magnificent word. Thank you for truth. God calls us to be thankful, truly thankful. And praise you, Lord. We can't do that unless you seven us. Lord, I'm tired. Help me to continue. Let me not get too weary. 
Once the fire, Lord, light a fire under me. And God will give you praise for everything. Only when you give us the strength to, in Christ's name we pray, amen.